Hello, this is AJ Hoag. I am the director of Effortless English. Hello, I'm the director of Effortless English. My name is AJ Hoag, and I will teach you to speak English powerfully. Welcome to the Effortless English show. Now, today's topic is writing. And actually, we're going to talk about reading and writing. And how can you be a better writer in English? And how can you improve your reading in English? And what are the benefits of reading and writing? Usually I talk about speaking. Effortless English is a speaking program. So that is our main focus. Our lessons are focused on learning to speak English powerfully. But reading and writing have their place and are useful. So let's talk about a few things. Hopefully my guests will be able to join us. Uh, author Teresa Snyder. Uh, if not, then I will just talk about reading and writing myself. So, first let's just talk about how children learn language. How do American children learn English? Specifically, what order do they learn the language in? What do they focus on first? Of course, they first focus on listening. Listening is the very first skill. And therefore, listening is the foundation. The, the language is built upon listening. And of course, babies in the beginning, they only listen for a period of time, many months. And this is called the silent period, when the child is listening only. They're silent. They're not saying any words. They cry a lot, but they're not speaking. Now eventually, of course, they will start to say words, you know, mama, daddy, whatever, and then eventually, you know, they're using more words, more words. But of course, they never stop listening. Even when they start speaking, still, most of the time during the day, they're listening. Still, most of their time is spent listening. And then they're also speaking as well. So, first we have listening then we have speaking added to it. These are not one then the other, they're added. So you have listening and then you, they're adding speaking to the listening, they're doing both. And then usually sometime around that time after they've been speaking a while, they can speak very simply, then they might start to get exposed to, exposed to reading. They will not start reading at that early age yet, maybe around one years old or nine months or something, uh, but they might start getting interested in books with pictures especially, if parents read to them. But of course the child is not actually reading or learning to read at that point. That comes later, after the child is speaking and is speaking quite fluently actually, speaking very well, uh, then they will actually learn to read. They'll, in English, they'll learn the sounds of the letters, and because their parents are reading to them, they'll start to understand and to see and read a few words. And of course, this, they'll build this little by little by little. So reading is the third skill that is added to listening and speaking. So when they're reading, of course, they don't stop speaking <laughs> and they don't stop listening. In fact, most of their day is still spent listening to English. And then, of course, they start really speaking a lot at this point. They're listening and speaking a lot, and then they start adding reading, really easy reading, easy, easy, easy reading. And as they get a few years older, you know, the reading gets more difficult, more difficult, and they start reading more and more and more and more. And then somewhere around that time, they will just begin to start writing the final skill. And when they, when a small child learns to write again in the beginning, they're just learning how to make the letters. A, they're draw, a lot of it's just handwriting practice, really. It's not really writing in terms of writing ideas or, or words. It's just more practicing how to make the letters because they're small children and they have 
their hands and their eyes need to learn how to do this. So much of early practice for writing for children is, is really more physical. And as, as adults, we don't need to worry about that. We can do that now. So real writing, where the child is writing their own ideas, right? They're not just copying something they're looking at, but they're actually trying to write and communicate with writing, communicating their own, their own ideas, their own feelings. That comes much later. And again, it starts very, very simply. Simple sentences, very basic. And then it gets, you know, just like every other skill, it's a little more difficult, a little more difficult, a little more difficult. And then in the United States, for example, uh, when I was growing up in school, uh, any kind of grammar study did not start for me, I think, until high school, maybe late middle school. And frankly, honestly, it was totally useless. Did not help my writing at all. So this is the order that naturally happens in life. And one of the big problems with people learning English uh, in schools, adults or, or learning English as a foreign language, is that usually the order gets completely mixed up. So in schools, typically, there is almost no listening, very little real listening. You know, the, the, the teacher is just talking about English, reading from a textbook or that kind of thing, but listening to real, like, meaningful English, it's very, very low. There's not a lot of it in, in a lot of English classes, certainly not in the beginning. What happens, usually in most schools, reading is the very first thing. Boom, you've got a textbook and you're immediately trying to read English. Focus on reading. And then another thing is that usually these textbooks have activities and they try to get you to start writing immediately. And so in schools, reading and writing are, are really the first things that are focused on and developed. And, and grammar, which should be the very last thing or completely ignored, is usually the very first thing that's taught in schools. While listening and speaking are a very small amount of the time in most English classes. This is completely mixed up, it's unnatural, and this is why after many years learning in schools, so many English learners can tell you about grammar rules but cannot use them correctly when speaking and can read English fairly well, but their writing is actually still bad. And then when it, they try to speak, uh, they feel nervous, and it, it's just a terrible situation. You know the situation because you've probably lived it already. So, of course, my first point today is that you still must focus on listening and speaking first. Listening and speaking must come first. And listening should be what you do most of each day. Listening and speaking should be the main things you're doing every day. That should take most of your time with English. And until you speak well and can listen and understand well, you don't need to be focusing a lot on writing. So what should you do? How do you use reading and writing? What's the most effective ways? Well, reading is actually very useful. And reading can help your speaking when you combine it with listening. And the easiest way to do this is audiobooks. I remember doing this as a small child. I mean, essentially, when a parent reads to a child, that's an audiobook. Right? If, if, I remember my mom re read to me all the time when I was very small, so if she read a book to me, that's the same as you listening to an audiobook in English. And that is a fantastic way to combine listening and reading. And reading in this way is very powerful. It will help your vocabulary a lot, your spoken vocabulary. So, combining them. So you can read when you, when you have some times, you can just read quietly. 
yourself, just reading the book, that's fine. And it's useful. But it's more useful when you read and then you're also listening to the audiobook at the same time. That's very powerful. Or you could read the book first and find the words you don't know and then go back and then read it again, this time, the second time, listening to the audio version also. You might even listen to that audiobook many times. That's powerful. That will help your reading ability, obviously, and it will help your speaking and listening too. So that's my first main suggestion for reading, is to combine it with listening, using audiobooks. So you have a textbook, text version of the book, not a, not a school textbook. You want to read novels. Uh, and then you have the audiobook, and you put them together. Very powerful. Now eventually, as you become more advanced, then, and you, you can speak English well, and you understand it well, then you can start doing more and more silent reading. See, in the beginning, silent reading is less useful because when you see the new words, you don't know how to say them. You have no idea. You look at it and you don't know how to pronounce it correctly. But as you get more advanced, that becomes quite easy. And then just silently reading books that's, uh, will become more and more useful. Just as, it, just as with a child, they eventually start reading and they don't need the audiobook. And then finally, writing will be your very last skill to focus on and develop at a, at, a, at a professional level. You can all write now. You can get your writing on Twitter. You can write. You're doing basic writing already. That's great. But if you want to develop your writing at, at a more professional level, that should be your very last skill, the last thing you focus on. OK. So that's the kind of the big introduction to reading and writing. I just want you to understand uh, the schedule about when do you focus on reading and writing and how do you do it. So it's, it's, it comes much later. So let's just say that you're ready now. What should you do? How do you become good at reading and good at writing? What should you read? What kind of things should you read? And, and how should you write? What's the process of writing like? Okay, so first the question of reading. Reading will help your writing. Just as listening helps your speaking, reading helps your writing. And in fact, the number one way to improve your writing is simply to read a lot of books. Constantly read, read, read lots and lots and lots of pages and books. Pages and books every day in English. When you read, most of your reading should be fairly easy for you. And it should be interesting to you. This is why when people ask me, AJ, what's the best book to read? That's just that that's a question I can't answer. The best book for what? The best book is the book that you are most interested in and you can understand. That's the best book. And so that book is different for everyone. Because I like science fiction, but other people don't. So if a science fiction book would be good for me, maybe not for you. I mostly read nonfiction now, and I, and I really like that. And I like to learn using nonfiction books. You might not like that, so maybe nonfiction is not good for you. So you have to make some effort yourself to try and search for books that are interesting and understandable to you. So you need to just you know, go to a library and, or just buy a bunch of different books and try them. You know, that's, that's the best way to do it. Now you should read novels or nonfiction. So in other words, books are what you're reading, not textbooks. Do not read school books that have grammar exercises and vocabulary lists and all of that. No, no, no. That will not help your reading. Okay, that's, that's useless. I, when I say that you should be reading every day, number one, you should read novels. Novels are storybooks. They're long stories, basically. So you could start with children's 
novels, and then you can move to young adult novels, and, and then finally to regular novels that are written for adults such as Stephen King or Teresa Snyder, one of our guests, she, she writes novels. Uh, she hasn't been able to join, unfortunately, uh, so we might have to try her again sometime, too. Use, figuring out this system with Google Plus uh, is a little complicated, it seems, that <laughs> had some trouble getting the guests onto the show. We'll keep trying. We'll figure it out. So you're going to read and read and read and read. Reading every day. This is after you're already speaking well. Then you start reading, 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 focusing more and more on reading, reading, reading. You probably need at least a year of just focusing on reading, reading lots and lots of books, big books, you know? And every day you're reading for an hour, a couple hours. And as your reading gets better, your writing will start improving more and more automatically. You don't think a lot about grammar rules while you're writing in the beginning. You might write a blog, you might write emails, write a diary, write a journal, all of these things. Just, but just write fast. Don't think about the writing too much. Focus mostly on reading for, I'd say, at least a year and probably more. And as you do this, your writing will naturally start to improve. Your reading, of course, will improve. Your vocabulary will improve. If you're still using audiobooks, your speaking will even improve. And eventually, finally, the, towards the end of your path in English, you finally reach a point where you're ready to become an excellent writer. And by excellent, I mean, you know, at a, a professional level. Maybe in business, or maybe as a journalist, or something at that level. Maybe to write books, be an author. At that level, then, you can start to focus on writing. And I'm not normally a writing teacher. I, I am a writer, <laughs> but I don't really teach writing. But I, So I can tell you how I do it and how most professional writers learn to write. And the, the first thing most professional writers do is, is that they just write a lot every day. They do not focus on grammar rules. I'm telling you, Professional writers do not study grammar books. Stephen King, Jack Kerouac, uh, Hemingway, all those guys were not constantly studying grammar books. That's not how they learned to write well. How did they learn to write well? They wrote a lot. Right? Every day they wrote pages. Now, professional writers, really good writers, they write every single day. And some of them might have a time period. So they, they might decide every day I will write for one hour or for four hours and I will do it every single day I'm going to write. They might write stories, they might write just their ideas. Some writers will just every day write in a journal for pages and pages of just their ideas and thoughts and little story ideas or, or how they're feeling or what they're seeing, describing what they see. And they're just constantly writing, writing, writing. And then they go back and they read what they wrote. And they can see which parts kind of sound good and which parts don't. And the next day, they write, 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 write again. Every single day, they're writing, 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 writing. At least an hour a day. And professional writers do more than that. At the same time, you know, they're still reading. This process is really what makes them good. And eventually, as they become better and better, they will decide to write something that will be published. So, uh, like a professional level of writing that others will see and that it needs to be really, really good. And when they do that, then they use a different process for writing. And that process is a process of rewriting and editing. Rewriting and editing. When you read a book, a novel, you're not reading the first version of the book. You read, a, say, a Stephen King book. He didn't just write that whole book exactly like that the first time. He wrote it out, he typed it out on his typewriter or computer. He wrote the, he wrote the book, or he wrote a chapter. And then 
Later, he went back and he read it. And then he found parts. Oh, I don't like this part. This part's not good. And maybe he circled parts and he found all the things he didn't like that he needed to change. And then he went back and he changed all those parts. So he rewrote it. He wrote the chapter again. Changing it, adding new ideas, getting rid of the mistakes. Then he goes back. He reads it again. He repeats that process a few times. He's still not done. Because then what he does is he sends that copy to someone else. And in fact, there's a whole team of people. It's not just one person. The first person might be an editor, professional editor. And this editor will read the story or the writing or the article, whatever it is. Journalists do this too. They'll read it, the story, and then they'll say, they'll again, they'll look for mistakes or weak points or unclear communication and they'll go back and they'll tell the writer, okay, I think you should change this, this part's not clear, uh, this is a mistake, this is a grammar mistake, this is a spelling mistake, and then the writer will write it again and change those things. And then, especially for books, they'll have, they'll have proofreaders that are separate from the writer, I mean, separate from the writer and separate from the editor, and the proofreaders will look at it and just define mistakes, grammar mistakes, spelling mistakes, all of that, and then they'll change all those things. And so that final piece that seems so fantastic and is very good took a very long time to finish. When I was doing a little bit of travel writing for an online magazine, I used the same process. So I was in Thailand and I wrote a story about Thailand and working in Thailand and how to get a job in Thailand and things like that. And so I, I first I just wrote out my ideas in, with my hand on paper. And I, I started writing story ideas in little paragraphs and pieces of it. That was my first version. Then I got the computer and then I, I wrote the full article. That was the second version. But then and I didn't like lots of it. Several pieces were not good. There were several mistakes in it, grammar and spelling. Uh, so then I went back, I wrote, rewrote it again, and it might take me one week or more to write the one article, maybe just a two-page article. And then finally I sent it to the editor, and the editor also had suggestions. I wrote it again, and then finally finished. So what's the point about this? The point is that, that excellent writing, when you read something and there are no mistakes and it seems perfect, well, that you know, you're reading like in a newspaper, for example, or a book, you just need to realize that did not happen quickly. And sadly, so many English learners get frustrated and upset because they make mistakes when they write. But everyone does, including the professionals. They just don't understand how the writing process works. That it's First of all, it's a team process usually. Usually there's at least one other person who is helping you find the mistakes and that all writers make mistakes and some writers make a lot of mistakes <laughs> and it's perfectly fine. So you need to understand the difference between that professional level of writing like an article or even in, in a business, you know, a, a, a business proposal, something very serious and then something that's more casual and relaxed like, uh, like a blog post or an email to a friend or a Twitter post. Those things are done very quickly, and they will naturally have mistakes sometimes, and that's okay. So you have this kind of fast, loose writing that you will do, and that's probably most of your writing, in fact. And you're going to do that all the time, and that will get better. Your mistakes will get less and less as you do it more. But then you have what you might call professional writing, you know, business writing, serious writing. It needs to be almost perfect, and that is a very long process. You make that good, not by being perfect in English, but by writing and rewriting and rewriting, and you make it good by getting help, getting other people to look at it and correct mistakes and help you create something that is really, really good. So, the point is that realize that these are two kinds of writing, and don't get upset. Nobody can do this perfect writing the first time quickly. No one writes a full, long article or book 
just uh, they just do it really quickly and then they send it in and it's published. That's not how it works. It's a long process, even for native speakers, even for professional writers who are paid millions of dollars for books. It's a long process. So, let's end this little uh, topic by talking about what you can do then to improve your writing right now. So, you know, I, probably most of you don't want to publish a book in English. <laughs> I'm guessing that for you, your the the writing that you maybe need in English is probably mostly casual writing, so blog posts, writing emails to friends, uh, Twitter and Facebook, and possibly in your businesses or in your jobs, uh, writing, doing written communication, again, such as emails. And then some of you also may need a little bit higher level of writing in English, where maybe you're doing uh, academic papers or you need to write articles for conferences or some kind of uh, articles for publications or magazines or newspapers uh, or maybe in business you need to do business proposals and business communication that needs to be good. So for most of you the first thing you should do is read, read, read a lot. When you're ready start reading a lot, a lot, a lot and you can use audiobooks if you need to work on your speaking still too. That's step one, and it takes probably a year of intensive reading, and maybe more. And then step two is to start doing a lot of fast writing. So you might have a blog, and you just write up every day. And you choose a time period. So you might say, okay, today, every day I will write for one hour. And you sit down, and you just write, write, write in English, or type on the computer, type, da, 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 da. And you just keep going, writing as fast as you can. You're not going to worry about mistakes. Nope. Don't correct your mistakes. Don't even think about grammar. Just writing and writing and writing and writing as much as you can. 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, or more. And again, you probably do that for a year. And finally, you can start writing and then going back and looking for mistakes and rewriting. Practice rewriting. So you might write, give yourself, a, instead of a time period, you might give yourself an amount. You might say, okay, I'll write two pages. And you write two pages about some, some topic. Then take a break, have a coffee, uh, want some water, then come back and read it and try to find the mistakes or find where, what you don't like. Think about it and then rewrite it again, make, trying to make it better. And then you'll do that maybe five times. And that's your practice. And you'll do that every single day. And in this way, you will become a very good writer. All right, so whew, that's our big talk today about writing. So let's now go to question time. Time for your questions. So we go to Twitter. If you have a question, type it on Twitter. And I cannot answer them all because they coming very fast, but I'll answer a few questions and maybe I'll answer yours right now. Let's see. Let me look at Twitter and see what we have. Okay, uh, here's a good question right, right at the beginning. Um, Adnan Kazimaman says, after getting fluency, should we learn grammar rules? Will it hurt our spoken English or not? What should we do? Um, that's a good question. And I'm going to see. Oh, we might be able to get our guest on because I may have made a mistake with her email. Um, so, should you learn grammar rules? Uh, I would say no. I would say no, unless you're an editor. You know, unless you're a professional editor, uh, and that's going to be your job. Do you need to be thinking about grammar rules when you write? No, not really. Not really. Uh, I think that by reading. Lots and lots and lots that you will get everything you need. Uh, I never think about grammar when I write, and I, I never did. I, again, I'm I write the way I talk. So when I write a sentence, if it, if I make a mistake and I just read it to myself and it sounds wrong, it feels wrong to me. I was like, ah, oh, that's not right. Hmm, is it is or are? You know, sometimes with the verbs, uh, if it's the subject. 
is uh, unclear. It's, it's a long subject, and there's a part that's you know just w one a singular subject, and there's a part that's plural that has more than one. And then sometimes in a long sentence it gets complicated, and you're like, okay, wait, the verb is it? Do I say is or do I say are or you know do I say? I, I don't give a better example. Do I say um, go or goes? Is it go or goes? Uh, and yeah, and sometimes I'll, I'll just read it, and I can't. I'm not sure which one sounds right. You know, th these little situations happen, but it's really I'm doing it more by feeling. I'm not con pick, getting a grammar book and trying to remember. You know, it's so actually no, I don't think grammar really helps that much. Honestly, I think reading will. If you have one hour to improve your writing. And the choice, you know, should you read for an hour or study grammar for an hour? Read. Read, read, read. The more you read real novels, real stories, real articles, the better your writing will get. It happens gradually, but, yeah, so that's my feeling. All right, let's see if we can get our guests, because we may have a chance. Let me try. I've gotten the email wrong, so let's try it. <laughs> Uh, I'll send it to both emails that I got. Let's see if we can get on that on air. Our guest is a professional writer. Okay, so I've sent my invitation to our guest. I'll answer some more questions now on Twitter. Let's see, what do we got? Okay. Uh, okay, someone says, Grammar Girl's website and books are a good resource for checking just one thing that doesn't seem quite right when writing. Okay, this is a good point. So again, this is how most writers actually um, use grammar. They might, after they've already written a bunch of stuff, after, during the rewriting, towards the end of the process, you might have a sentence and you're still not sure. You're like, ah, put the apostrophe there, you know, that kind of, like, it's, it's. Do you have an apostrophe or no? Uh, is it I-T apostrophe S or just I-T-S? And native speakers, always, even I, I've got, I, can't, I always forget, you know, oh, which, which one is it? So you might check that. You might go to a grammar book or site to check something like that. That's really an editor's job. Now, if you're, some, sometimes you have to be your own editor, and that's fine, but just realize that that's not really writing. Writing, the writing process is not focused on grammar. It's focused on communication, just like speaking. But the, the, the nice thing about writing is that it can be done very, very slowly. And so you can add editing. You can add the, that editing time with writing. And that's quite useful because then you can you can actually take days and days and days. You can actually have someone else edit what you wrote, and they can find the problems or the mistakes or help with the grammar. Or you can do it yourself. You can maybe take a break, come back the next day, and then just look, make sure you you haven't made too many mistakes. So in that sort of situation, it can be useful just to open up some kind of grammar thing and just check really quickly. Oh, did I do? Did I write that correctly? That's how, that's the way to use grammar in a, in a grammar book. Not to be studying and memorizing it like some kind of Bible, but rather just to quickly check it up. Oh, you know, you have, you've already written something, you're rewriting it again, you're just trying to check your mistakes, you're really just proofreading. And then you can, oh, quickly open the grammar book, oh, yeah, and check something. That's, that's okay. That's all right. All right, let's see what else. Uh, ah, Julia says, I would like to read books listening to your voice. Yes, I, my book is, so speaking of, <laughs> uh, I am writing a book, and my first version is finished, and guess what? What did I do? Of course, when I was writing that, I rewrote it several times, looking at it again and again. Then I sent the version to the editor, and, and already now, after I sent it to the editor, I'm already thinking of ways I can improve it, so I'm going to start doing some rewriting right now. And I'll send that second version to the editor, then the editor will read it and find mistakes and uh, areas that are not clear and 
the editor will give me suggestions, and then I'll rewrite it again. So I'm doing the same process. And yes, I will provide an audio book when my book is published, so you can you will be able to listen to my book too. No problem. Okay. Uh, how long did it take you to write your book? How often did you have to rewrite it? So this is Barbell. That's a good question. So uh, for my book, I mean, the books take months, months and months to write. Um, it just depends. You know, every writer has a little bit of a different way of doing it. Some writers sit down and just, like Jack Kerouac, you know, he would, uh, he wrote every single day, but when he wrote some of his books, he wrote them in just a few days. But he didn't sleep. <laughs> he just wrote all day long. He was drinking coffee and taking drugs to keep him awake, and he just, he just wrote for 24 hours, you know, uh, with no sleep for two, three days. Uh, I'm not quite that kind of writer. Other writers, you know, they write a little bit. They might write for an hour every morning, and it takes them many months to finish a book. Uh, I tend to... Uh, I, I write every day in my journal, uh, and then when I have a project like a book, uh, once I sort of feel like I'm ready to get on the computer, I like to write... I'll write for a few hours every day, and it, it might take me a couple months that the... You know, it's hard for me to say how long to take to write the book because it's still not finished. Uh, but to write the first draft of the book, uh, maybe a month. Yeah. But you know, as I said, I it just really depends. Sometimes shorter things take longer. When I was writing articles, travel magazine articles, uh, you know, it might take me one week or two weeks to write one a one or two page article. For a magazine, it's a little bit longer. For something more like a newspaper, it might be one page. For a magazine, maybe a few pages. But I might take two weeks to write that because I want it to be very, very good. Sometimes shorter things are harder. Like to write a poem that's only this long, it might take a month. So it's because you're rewriting, you're rewriting, you're rewriting, you're rewriting. Oh, you're always trying to get it perfect. and So it really depends. Okay, Milky Way has a question. Is it okay to not understand some words in the novels, although you understand the whole meaning? Exactly right, Milky Way. That is how you choose a book. That's how you know that the level's good for you. You understand the whole thing. So you read a page, you understand what's happening in the story. Right? You, 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 don't, you don't need to look up every fourth word. You know, you're not circling half the words on the page. Maybe there are a couple words, a few words on the page you don't know, or you're not sure about, but because you understand the whole idea, you understand what's happening in the story, you can guess the meaning of the new words. You don't need a dictionary. That's the perfect level. It's not exactly scientific. You have to just kind of try different books and see, do I understand what's happening? Can I imagine in my head everything that's happening? And then when you see those new words, can you guess what they probably mean? You don't need to be correct, it's okay. But can you basically guess, yeah, I think I understand kind of what that means. If yes, that's a good level for you, keep reading. You don't want to be using a dictionary while you're reading an interesting novel. That's terrible. You're stopping all the time looking at a dictionary. Blech. No fun. It takes all the fun out of reading. So don't do that. Read something more that's more easy for you, it's easier, and just guess the meaning of the new words. And as you find, these new words will come back again and again and again, and each time you see them, you'll guess better, and eventually you'll just know the, the meaning of the word, never using a dictionary. That's how you learn vocabulary from reading. Good question. All right, a few more questions and then we're done. Can you tell me the contents of your book? Uh, will it be about studying English with all your methods? That's right. This is uh, uh, M -N -I -I, Twitter, M-N-I-C-A-T-1. He's asking, yeah, what is the content of my book? What's the subject of the book? My book is, is about the effortless English system. So I have a lot of information on, on YouTube videos and podcasts and articles that I've written and uh, lessons that I've done, all of this stuff. 
And so I'm just I'm organizing all of the main ideas of the effortless English system and putting it into one book that explains the core, the heart of the system. What are the main, most important parts of learning English with effortless English? And why are they important and how do you do them? So it's, it's a book that explains in detail the full effortless English system. Okay. A couple more questions and then I guess we're done. And we'll have to try our guest next time. All right. Okay, uh, this is asking how am I going to sell my book? How are you going to sell your book? In two forms, audiobook and text? Uh, yeah, that's right, exactly. Uh, so the book uh, will be sold uh, in audiobook versions and also text. So you, you can listen and you can read both. And for the text versions, there will be ebooks like Kindle or Kobo or things like that. And there will also be print versions you know, that you can hold in your hand and that are, will be sold in bookstores and on Amazon. So, yeah, you can, you, you can get... There'll be a large variety of choices for you. But there's certainly I will record an audiobook version. We'll, re we'll probably publish the text version first because it's faster. And then after that's published, I'll go in a studio and I'll read it and we'll record it. It will be audio, yes. Okay, this is, this is a good question. I like this one. Il Maestro says, if I read books out loud, will it improve my speaking or pronunciation? Uh, pronunciation, no. I'd say no, it won't improve your pronunciation. Uh, because if you're just reading out loud, how do you know how to say the words correctly? There, you have no audio input. So will that improve your pronunciation? No, it will not. Will it improve your speaking? Maybe. That could help. Yes, it can help you just get used to saying the words. So if you're going to read out loud, use something very easy. Use something that you already know how to pronounce all the words. Because if you're trying to, if you're reading a word out loud and you're not sure how to pronounce it, then you might be practicing bad pronunciation. That's not good. So use some, use easy things and read them out loud. And yeah, that will get you get your mouth you know, kind of training your mouth to speak English. That's fine. So reading out loud can be useful. Just when you read out loud, <coughs> when you read out loud, read easy, easy things. For pronunciation practice, you need to be listening. So a better way to practice pronunciation is to listen to an audio, pause, and then copy the speaker. And try to say it exactly the way the speaker said it copying their pronunciation, or use a movie, right, and play one sentence in the movie, pause, and copy the actor, and how, copy how they say the sentence, copy how they move, copy how they use their mouth, all of that. That's better for pronunciation. But just for general speaking, just get used to speaking more for fluency. Reading aloud can be good, yes. All right. Two more questions and we're done. Okay. Uh, let's, let me just make, look at some of the old questions too. Okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, okay, here's a good common question. Maxiange19 asks, how long... Or I guess she's actually... No, she's in, when will I know I have become fluent in English speaking? When will I know? Okay, this is a good question. You know, when will I? There's different versions of this question. How long until I become fluent? Uh, how how will I know I am fluent? All of these questions. Well, first of all, we we use this word fluency, meaning kind of easy, effortless speaking. And people always talk about I'm fluent in a language. Uh, you know, there's a guy who says he becomes fluent in a language in three months. And then someone else says, oh, I became fluent in six months. And then other people will say, no, that's impossible. You need two years or more to become fluent. So why, is, why do they all disagree? Well, it's because that word fluent is not scientific. It's just, uh, it means different things to different people. Uh, so 
it's 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 not precise. It's not we you know it, it's many people have very different ideas about what does fluent mean. So it's not a very useful goal to say I want to be fluent in English. What does that mean? I don't know. You probably some people probably think you're fluent now. I mean, like the guy who speaks a language in three months, he says he's fluent. Why does he say he's fluent? Uh, because he can have uh, some basic conversations in the language, but he's making like the mistakes. He's speaking like a little small child. Um, he doesn't sound like a native speaker at all. Is that fluency? I don't know. Maybe. But then another person, they say, no, no, fluency means you're almost a native speaker and you're not making many mistakes and you can communicate and talk about a lot of different subjects. And for someone else, that's fluency. Can you do that in three months? No. So you need to first decide what how do you want to use English? Don't instead of using the word fluency, which is almost meaningless, you need to instead say, "How do I want to use English?" So a better goal would be something like, uh, "I want to use English easily and powerfully in my job. I want to talk to customers and clients in English and not feel nervous, feel totally relaxed." and I want to communicate all of the ideas I need to communicate clearly. They understand me, I understand them, and all this happens very quickly. That's a very precise, a very specific uh, measure of your English ability. And you'll, you can decide more, ah, yes, this is happening, right? You're at work and you'll know it's happening. Or maybe your goal is much simpler. Maybe you say, I just want to be able to talk to Americans about basic things. I'm going to travel to America. I want to be able to order in restaurants and uh, get bus tickets and plane tickets and have basic everyday conversations with people without being stressed and without uh, stopping, without hesitating. It's okay if I'm making mistakes, grammar mistakes, but I want to just communicate kind of quickly at a basic level. And maybe that's your idea of fluency. Again, you can test that. You can go to America and you, you know, is it happening or is it not happening? So I recommend being more specific about how you want to use English. And then how long it takes, it really depends on, you know, how difficult. What, what's your goal? Some, if you want to get up on a stage and you want to be able to speak powerfully for, you know, six, seven, eight hours, and then you also want to be able to have a conversation with uh, very educated people about, you know, science and economics and uh, also your feelings and psychology and current events and the news. And you also want to be able to understand television and movies and comedies. Well, that's a much higher level. <laughs> it's going to take longer. Just so I recommend starting and just being very specific about what's the next thing you want to be able to do. And then just take those step by step. Like for me, for Spanish, for example, uh, I'm kind of I'm focusing on Spanish a little bit again. My goal is I'm doing the Camino, El Camino de Santiago. I'm, I'm going to be in Spain for a month walking on this path. So my first goal with Spanish, I just I want to be able to get hotels and food and directions. You know, where is this town? <laughs> basic, and then some maybe basic, really basic conversation. Hi, how are you? Where are you from? Simple, simple, simple stuff. That's my fluency goal for Spanish. Very basic communication. And I want to do all that without stress. I'll be happy with that. That's, that's, that's what I need Spanish for. And maybe at some point I'd like to be able to talk about effortless English in Spanish. That's a much higher level. And that would come later. I, may, I might do that. I might not do that. But this basic level, I definitely need the basic level for traveling. But that's what I'm focusing on. So decide in your life what is what does fluency mean for you. You decide. Don't, don't worry about what other people say. That's, that's their idea. All right, our last question. Okay, uh, yeah, this is a good question. It's about future guests. Max Galtieri says, will you invite uh, to be your guest in future shows Steve Kaufman, 
Stephen Crash, and, and Tony Robbins. Well, I guess before I invite more guests, we need to figure out how to get them on the show. <laughs> because last week, Shri was supposed to be a guest. In fact, for two weeks, Shri was supposed to be a guest, and we could never get her onto the show you know, to, to work on Google+. And then this week, Teresa Snyder was supposed to be a guest, and I, we could never get her onto Google+, Plus as a guest. So uh, I need to figure out a simple way to make sure the invitations are working so we actually get the guests on the show. So I'm not going to invite anybody yet, uh, anybody like that who's, who's uh, uh, I don't know personally or, or at least don't have like a nice relationship with because it'd be too frustrating. I don't want Tony Robbins on the show and he's, he's getting angry because we can't get, get him on the show, you know? So we're just going to wait for a while and get this figured out first. Eventually, you know, Tony Robbins... Why I could try, why not? But I, I doubt Tony Robbins will become a guest, and he's a uh, busy, busy guy. And you know, honestly, he tends to do bigger things, like television and things like that. Uh, however, I will be certainly uh, inviting Steve Kaufman from Link and Stephen Krashen, the, the famous uh, researcher. Definitely, we'll try to get those guys on the show. We'll, we'll invite them. Yeah, they'll say yes or they'll say no. I don't know. But uh, I, I would like to have Steve, uh, Steve Kaufman. I would like to have uh, Stephen Krashen. I would like to have Blaine Ray, founder of uh, TPRS. Uh, who else? Uh, I'd like to have David Long, who is the director of the Thai language program at AUA in Bangkok, but they do a lot of interesting things there. Uh, and there, there are several people I'd like to have on. And also, not just language people. I'd like to have people who, just success people. I would like to have people who are successful in some part of their life and have them talk to us about how do you become successful in different areas of life. So that's what we'll be doing eventually. It's just that uh, we have to get the technology figured out uh, so that we can actually have the guests on the show. You know, it worked with my dad. It's worked with uh, Oscar and Julia and Farabelle, but we've had some problems lately. So we'll see. Okay, then. I think that is the end. Let's just go with Effortless English News, and then we're done. So, Effortless English News, what's happening in Effortless English? Uh, my book is the main project. That, that will be the next new thing coming, probably. And I've already mentioned, sent it to the editor. We'll be doing re some rewriting. Hoping around the beginning of May that the, the writing will be finished. Then we have to design the book. That takes time, too. So right now, hoping to publish the book sometime at the end of the summer, so that the like end of August, September, some, sometime around there. We'll see. Uh, it's not completely in my control. I can only do the writing part. After that, I have to rely on other people. So we'll see. But that's our target. Another piece of effortless English news. I am planning to do a tour of Southeast Asia in the winter. Uh, should be a book tour. If the book is published, it will be a book tour. And I will go around to different cities in Southeast Asia. Uh, hopefully I can go to some bookstores. I might do some book signings. So you can buy my book and I'll sign it. And do I'll do some speeches. So not full events, not big, big events, but maybe like a one-hour speech and then I'll answer some questions and just, just to meet you, basically. And again, you could bring the book, and I'll sign it. And then I'll also do some seminars. Certainly, I'll be doing a big seminar in Hanoi again. Possibly Jakarta, KL, and or Bangkok as well. Big seminars. In this tour, I'm planning to visit uh, most of the, well, many of the countries in Southeast Asia. So Vietnam, definitely. And I'll probably visit Ho Chi Minh City this year. Bangkok, definitely. Maybe Chiang Mai and Phuket in Thailand as well. Uh, probably Kuala Lumpur. Probably Singapore. Possibly Jakarta. Definitely a few places in Indonesia. Uh, possibly uh, Yangon in uh, Myanmar, Burma. And India. Possibly South India. I'm thinking uh, Bangalore 
and uh, Chennai, Mysore, possibly Mumbai. We'll see. And possibly Kathmandu. I don't know. This is the general idea, and I'll let you know as uh, it gets closer. I'll tell you more information about possible a book tour. And uh, I think that's the main news. Uh, for some, for the mission team, the people who sent me the testimonials with their close-up pictures, I'll, you'll get an email soon. We'll do a special webinar just for you. Yay! And by the way, for that, to be in the mission, you had to send a close-up picture. A couple people did, uh, didn't, I think we had one or two people did not send a picture, and uh, we had one person did not send a close-up, so they sent a picture with other people, and we can't use that. So we'll contact you and ask you to please send a close-up picture, so your face, only your face, maybe, maybe like this. Okay, <laughs> so that'll be great. The mission team, that's going to be a team of people totally focused on just spreading the Effortless English mission. That's what we'll talk about in the webinar, and we may do this maybe every month with those mission team members, just people who are willing to talk about Effortless English online or offline and help us get more people working on our mission. So I'll give you more information about that soon. And I guess that's it. That's the Effortless English News. Let's end, as always, with our... Uh, mission and our code and our values. Now our code is very simple, it's just three things. Number one, we do the best we can. We do our best. That means we're human beings, we make mistakes sometimes. Sometimes there are problems we can't solve. Sometimes there are things we cannot do. That's okay. We do our best. We do what we can, do our best. So we do the best we can. Uh, number two, we do the right thing. We always try to do the right thing. And that means that we, you know, we generally try to be polite and, and helpful. We don't, we're not mean to other people. I think we all basically know what that means, right? It just means treating people well and, and not, not being mean, not being a jerk. And when we make a mistake, if, if we do something bad, you know, we just apologize. I'm sorry. Very simple. And then finally, we show other people we care or we show each other we care. And that means we actively say nice things to other people. We compliment people. We encourage people. We support them. That's our code. It's a simple code. And uh, this is the code that really creates our special community. It's why we have a special community. And I'm very tough about this code. And when someone breaks this code in a, in a, in a bad way, uh, Boom, they're gone. I'm done. I have no patience with people who don't try to follow the code. Because this is the code that creates such a positive, wonderful community. So I'm a, sometimes I have to be the tough guy. Usually I'm just really nice and friendly, and I'm happy. that's my normal personality. But occasionally I have to be the tough leader. And uh, if someone breaks that code, they're gone. We don't want people uh, who are insulting or you know, we're not going to follow the and respect the code. Our mission. This is our deeper purpose. And this is not just me, but it's the deeper purpose of everyone in Effortless English, all our members, all our fans, all our crew, everybody, you, me, all of us, to explore new opportunities for growth, to bring confidence, vitality, and happiness to people all over the world, to boldly go where we have never gone before. This mission is about Number one, lifelong learning, constantly trying to learn and grow, grow as a person, grow wiser, grow more intelligent, grow more knowledgeable, proving, improving, improving, and learning all the time, as long as we're alive. And the second, the heart of that code is about contribution. It's about helping others feel more confident and be happier. Our mission is to make people happier through learning, through education, using English, using psychology, using many different things, but that's our, the deep purpose is to help other people feel stronger and happier. And boldly going means we're also explorers, we're also adventurers, we're always exploring new ideas, and let's be honest, English is the international language, so travel is part of that, exploring new worlds, exploring new cultures, exploring new ideas. That's our mission. Our value is very simply devotion to the mission is the number one value. It means we're all devoted to that mission. We're all working on that mission. 
We're all working to bring more people into that mission. Number two, enthusiasm. We're excited about life. We're excited about the mission. Number three, constant and never-ending improvement. We're always trying to improve. Not to be perfect, just to improve. Uh, number four, contribution. Again, we're, we, we contribute, meaning we give, we help others. That might be just our family and our close friends. It might include our whole community. It might include the whole world, all members of Effortless English. Contribution. Uh, number five is self-reliance, meaning uh, we're independent learners, and we rely on ourselves. We take responsibility for ourselves and our actions. We don't try to blame other people for everything. We're responsible. Uh, number six is persistence. means when something is important to us, we don't quit. We don't stop. We keep going. We keep going. We keep going. We're persistent. And number seven, positive leadership. We lead by helping other people get stronger. There's some leaders out there, they, they, they make people weak. They yell at people and they make people feel bad and they, they lead with fear. That's not us. We lead with strength. We help other people in our team, in our community, get stronger. We show people, we help people get stronger. Positive leadership. All right. That is today's Effortless English show. Um, I love you all. Thank you so much. Always great to talk to you. I apologize that our guest, Teresa Snyder, was not able to join us. Uh, we'll work on the technical problems and do a better job of getting people onto the show. We'll do the best we can. <laughs> and we'll eventually figure out how to get people onto this show more reliably, the guests. So. But still, I hope uh, you enjoyed just listening to me this time. So I will see you next time, and have a great week. Have a great day. I'll see you on Twitter every day, as usual. So, mwah. Bye for now. Keep working on your English. You can do it. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.